Hello everyone. It's Thursday, July 7th, 2022. My name is Annie Daly. On behalf of VMUG, I'd like to welcome you to today's VMware webcast. What is VMware Tanzu? Presented by Bosky, Senior Technical Marketing Architect, and Ryan, Senior Technical Marketing Ar Architect. Before we begin, I have three quick housekeeping items to go over. First, today's webcast will be recorded and available for you on demand. You'll receive an email with the on-demand link, so keep an eye out for that. Second, a Q&A session will follow today's presentation if we still have time. All questions will need to be entered in the question and answer section on the side. Please feel free to ask questions throughout the presentation. Third, there will be a short online evaluation that pops up as you exit the webcast. Please take a minute and let us know what you thought of today's session and what you might like to see going forward. All right, let's get started. Bosky, I'll hand it over to you now. Thank you, Anne. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, so I'm here with Ryan Baker, and we are going to talk a little bit about what is Tanzu. Um, I think this this presentation needs a full hour, so please uh, bear with us for the whole hour. Um, we hope to like really educate you on what is Tanzu, what we're doing, what are the solutions that we have been you know bringing to the market, etc. Now, um, before we get into what is Tanzu, I think just to take a look back at what we have been doing, even as VMware as an industry, it has always been about an evolution, the technologies that we have been bringing, whether it's virtualization, cloud computing, um, you know, software-defined data center, all of that has been really, you know, in, in a step-up evolution. And this is really what was optimizing the time it took from applications being written or coded and, and then them being deployed, right? Uh, and this was way before VMware, you know, if you think about what VMware did or what the industry has been doing, whether it was the DevOps, whether it's cloud computing, whether it's um, <clears throat> all the chef puppet recipes, you know, infrastructure as code, et cetera. It has always been a lot about optimizing the cycle time between application being written and application being deployed. And, um, you know, as VMware, if you think about what we did at the beginning, right, late, we, the first thing that VMware did was really bringing in um, a hypervisor or a virtual uh, thin layer in, in, in desktops and laptops through Fusion and through Workstation, right? And so that was essentially bringing those efficiencies to uh, development teams. And then we took that same theories, they, that same technology and brought that into serverware. So that way we were virtualizing entire infrastructures, right? But essentially all of what we have been doing, whether this is VMware, whether these are the different vendors, whether the industry as a whole, what have we have been doing is really reducing the toil and the cycle time it takes from um, you know, applications being developed to applications being deployed in production. If we take a brief, look down history and if you think about the process right what it was the cycle time between applications being written and deployed before virtualization this is this was something you know this was the different steps the different teams um, you know things have to cross over in order for them to be deployed and ready right <clears throat> from application being written tested in a physical host you know, three teams testing them, then shipping that code in physical format, CDs, etc., to the IT team from ID teams taking them and giving them, you know, giving a heads up to storage network teams, etc., building or carving out VLANs, you know, creating storage arrays, etc., and then finally carving out a maintenance window, either it's updating or installing that new particular piece of software again, involving your network teams to load balance. And finally, you know, that's when the application gets deployed. Now, if you think about the whole process, it was not just, you know, this this entire process took us between six months to a year for, you know, a release to come out or a software a version to come out, right? If you look at it from the lens of some of the key pillars, right? If you look, most of this was really, not just a lengthy process, but it also involved like interactions between really, really siloed teams. There were so many teams exchanging hands, right? From developments to teams, to QE teams, to IT, to, to storage, to network, et cetera, right? 
and anything that required to deploy or update a software needed a huge maintenance window. Now, because the deployment times and development times were so big, if there was a mistake, if there was a bug that had to be fixed, again, the time to fix that was pretty large. And of course, the complexity to scale, right? It, you know, it's scaling means, you know, standing up a new physical host, doing exactly the same things to it, again, talking to all the different teams, etc. And so like before virtualization, this is what, you know, it meant deploying, you know, the cycle times between the two stages, right? Now, with virtualization, we definitely lowered a lot of these metrics or parameters uh, because we now had a new unit of deployment called the virtual machine which made things a little bit more portable um, <clears throat> and with the invent of software defined data center where we had storage as a software network as a software defined methods right we were able to not just deploy that unit of code or a unit of software through virtual machines you know traversing from somebody's desktop or a laptop to a vSphere somewhere to um, you know a cloud um, v cloud somewhere right and so if you looked at, you know, now from a, from a storage network and uh, IT perspective, the VI admins were now really dealing with a lot of the, uh, you know, instead of talking to different storage teams, network teams and all of that, the VI admin was really, the, you know, the, 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 the platform person who was deploying really those applications and, um, you know, building necessary building blocks within the software defined data center to create or to uh, to layer that application on top of that now as such we reduced a lot of these parameters right there were lesser siloed teams of course there were still siloed teams like development development teams were separate from teams that were like vi admins and <clears throat> you know we we did have that separation but then at least from a storage network and compute perspective, it all started to collide between just a single team that was, you know, the team that was handling the vSphere's and the uh, VI infrastructures. Similarly, we reduced the maintenance window because again, if the initial deployment cycles were reduced, we of course had a, you know, the, the window to deploy and maintain that was less, the window to fix bugs, the, the this, you know, the complexity to scale reduced because, you know, it was more about duplicating virtual machines and then layering on your network services on top of that to do a lot of this. So we reduced a lot of the toil, we reduced a lot of the, complexities we reduced you know maybe it didn't take an year to deploy something or six months but we went down from that time period to maybe two to three months but yet we were still like you know there were still optimizations i mean the parameters still were like half point scale right so we still had more room for optimization and that is where we you know containers and kubernetes came in so instead of virtual machine being that unit of deployment, we now moved further that abstraction layer and said, okay, a container image is now a unit of deployment or the base unit that holds a complete application together, or at least a module of an application together. And as such, um, you know, with containers, we reduced that unit size. And then we brought in Kubernetes, wherein Kubernetes was now able to orchestrate a lot of those, you know, requirements that the application needed, right? Um, and with the software-defined data center beneath Kubernetes, it was really becoming simple for Kubernetes to say, okay, you know what, I need compute for this, I need such and such networking for this particular application, I need a load balancing service, etc., and I'm going to talk to the software-defined data center and bring all everything alive. This reduced uh, the uh, kind of the siloed teams all the way down. Right now, you really have an app dev team that's really building code, that's really writing code. It's instrumenting what the business logic is needed. Then uh, it doesn't necessarily have to talk to an IT team or there's no handover. They can literally write Kubernetes YAML files defining what the application needs. And Kubernetes, is, as long as they have access to the Kubernetes API on top of your vSphere or on top of a cloud provider, that said, Kubernetes then takes charge. It automates everything. It automates everything needed to be created within that infrastructure to be deployed, right, for that application. So 
the Kubernetes really merged or confused or you know f or fused the, you know, a lot of these teams and structures together. Uh, it you know, which meant like you know less siloed, less team switching, less crossing hands, etc. Uh, maintenance windows were smaller. Scaling was super easy. It, you know, it's built into the design of Kubernetes to scale, etc. But at the same time, um, you know, while we reduced a lot of this toil time, there was a new barometer that came up because Kubernetes is now only seven years old, right? It's a new technology. Uh, people don't necessarily get what Kubernetes is even today. Um, you know, the people who are teams that are you that want to use or leverage containers have a skill gap where not they don't find many people who understand what Kubernetes is and what to do and how to architect applications around Kubernetes, right? So there is a ramp up time, although from an instrumentation perspective, from an automation perspective, Kubernetes really, really, you know, helped um, automate a bunch of things and reduce the toil, but at the same time, somebody who is now writing a piece of code needs to be aware of what are the objects within Kubernetes, what is Kubernetes. So there's a learning curve that came up with Kubernetes, right? And so while we did get optimizations in the automation of the infrastructure space, but there's a little bit more time needed to, uh, from a team perspective, to really understand a lot of what has to be done. Like with virtualization, virtual machine had everything and you know, you didn't have to do much. The The application architecture stays the same. You know, the dev teams were operating the, the way they are always operating, except just that, you know, their piece of code was shipped in an OVA and an OVF format instead of it being a software disk. But with Kubernetes and containers, things change. It's not, it's, it's not as easy to just keep your architecture same and then ship something in a container image because that's just a bloated container. You have to also re-architect a little bit according to what Kubernetes constructs are, right? So there were some optimizations. There, I mean, there were major optimizations, but then there is also a cost to that optimization. And that is where we are today, right? Like from, if you look at reducing the toil between the cycle times from applications being written to deployed as an industry, as VMware, as everybody, right? We have gone through all these different phases and that is where we are today, right? And there's room for optimization. Uh, we can take these, you know, we, there is still room to reduce toil in what we are doing. And I think that is what we are here to talk about today, right? If you think about Kubernetes as that central platform that abstracts a lot of the infrastructure, it you know Kubernetes really simplifies DevOps. You don't necessarily have to deal with Chef or Puppet recipes to you know create infrastructure as code in order to uh, you know orchestrate something. You just let Kubernetes know what you want, and Kubernetes runs everything the way you expect it to. Whether and the, the thing about Kubernetes is it can run exactly the same. Way, whether you're running it on vSphere, whether you're running it on Google Cloud, AWS, etc., it doesn't really matter. It's multi-cloud inherently, right? It, it is designed to be multi-cloud. And that is why you get portability, right? Like if you have applications today, the not bound API for Kubernetes is, stays the same whether you're running it on any given infrastructure, and which is great, which gives you so much flexibility, it reduces the uh, toil time taken from a DevOps perspective, it gives you multi-cloud capabilities, portability, etc. But then if you think about, you know, the abstraction layers at which the Kubernetes platform sits and somebody who is maintaining and managing the entire stack, it is complex. It requires a lot of maintenance and we'll get into that. Again, there is a learning curve, you know, development teams need to understand the objects and what is Kubernetes and what are the different, what is a replica set versus a deployment type versus a service type, et cetera, right? You need to learn a lot more and then have to architect your application, your development processes across, around that. At the same time, because Kubernetes is multi-cloud, it, it works on every cloud, it works everywhere. It has a very complex ecosystem, right? Because it has to support so many different bases. It so many different systems, it has a complex ecosystem, uh, you know, which is, you know, the byproduct of being supporting so many different places and so many different infrastructures. Now, if you think about today, 
what the cloud native application development process looks like from application being written to deployed. Let's take a deeper look at that, right? Assuming somebody is doing this with containers and Kubernetes in mind, right? So if you think about the application development team, right, they're going to write a piece of code. Um, even to begin writing a piece of code, depending upon the language that they are writing into, they need to understand, okay, what is my directory structure? You know, what is, do I need to take care of certain startup things? Like, am I thinking about security when I'm writing certain piece of software, etc.? So that's, you know, the end, the barrier to entry is there. And then once, even if like, let's say they have actual, let's say they're using Spring and they've started, you know, a starter, Spring starter, and they've started writing a Spring Boot based application. Once they have written that, they then need to containerize everything. Um, they need to write Docker files. They need to kind of, you know, um, validate everything that they have done in a container, create a container, test that within their local development environments or in the Kubernetes, you know, cluster somewhere. And once they are ready, they can ship that or commit that code. And where somebody else, maybe it's a DevOps team or DevSecOps team, is going to take that container image. They're going to figure out how to deploy that. They're going to <clears throat> make sure that there is no vulnerability between that container image. They're then going to convert that application requirement to a YAML file. And today, this could be a single team. I'm just showing the process here. But this could be same one team. This could be two different teams. It really depends upon how the organization is structured. But essentially, this is a process any team would go through when they're working with Kubernetes, containers, etc. right? They are going to detect vulnerabilities, they're going to write YAML files, they're going to, you know, they need a storage capacity, they need then they then need to figure out where is their production Kubernetes environment, how do I access, where is my API, etc. And then once they have everything, they're going to push this to production. Now to push put put the um, containerized application onto a Kubernetes cluster, a production cluster, the cluster itself has to be maintained very well. It has to be, you know, because Kubernetes has such a complex ecosystem, it has to kind of figure out where is, uh, you know, whether the stack has everything, you need monitoring capabilities, you need to secure everything, um, you know, maintain, lifecycle manage, all of that, whoever is maintaining that, you know, production cluster has to do that, right? And then, of course, that each team, whether they are the uh, person who is writing the application, whether it's the person who is deploying or building the YAML files, they all need access to that same API because they are all going to write for that. They're all testing against that. They're all going to, you know, see what's happening. It's, it's a very dynamic situation. You just don't want to deploy and sit there. You want to see what's happening. You want to monitor. You may want to do some A-B testing, et cetera, right? So... The person who is maintaining that platform has to then give access to that platform back to these teams in some fashion. Now, for simplicity, let's call the first set of team like application development teams, the middle one, the DevSecOps of the DevOps team, and then the last one is the platform operations team, right? Just to ease out, I mean, you might have these teams, you might not, you might just be a single team that does a lot of this team, or you might have two teams within your organization that do a lot of these capabilities, irrespective of that, just to make things simpler from you know presentation perspective. To, um, I'm just going to call these three different teams, and one does app dev, one does DevOps, and one does platform ops, right? If you look at the application development team, what do they need, right? And what are their challenges? What they need is really access to simple dev tools that they can kickstart their development process. Like if you are a new team member on, on you know, you're joining a team and, you know, there's a there's a there, there's a application that's already been written. What you really need as an application developer is really to figure out, okay, what are my starting points? What is the structure? Is there enough documentation? Um, etc. And then where is my development cluster? Where is my, you know, where do I get access to dev tools? Where do I get access to, where's my Git repo, etc. right? Now the challenges again is, okay, even if I have a lot of these things, uh, 
I still have to figure out if I don't know Kubernetes, I have a learning curve there. I have to figure out what are Docker files. I have to figure out how to build a Docker file. Um, I have to think about security. I have to still think about code directory structure. There's a lot still to kind of go through from an app dev perspective in terms of what are the challenges and still like, you know, where the optimizations can happen, right? If you think about a DevOps, you know, the second layer, once the application has been written, container images have been created, and the code has been committed to a, a Git repo, right? The DevOps team that is then going to take that Git repo or that source code and then going to deploy workloads onto a Kubernetes cluster has to think about, okay, how do I access, do I need GitOps style deployment? You know, where, you know, where are my clusters? What is, how do I access the production cluster? Is it automated? Do I have to fetch it from someplace? Um, how, you know, what are the application requirements? What kind of YAML files do I need to configure? Uh, or what are the Kubernetes options do I need to configure, etc.? And then once I deploy that, how do I know it, my application has been deployed? Can I get access to the Kubernetes API, some monitoring tools, some logging tools, so I know what's going on, what's I've started deploying the app, right? So from a DevSecOps, the DevOps perspective, the real challenges really are like, where is my Kubernetes API? Um, I have to write multiple YAML files just to deploy all my applications in a single Kubernetes cluster. Um, I need to identify what are my different config dependencies for my application and make sure that I create those objects within Kubernetes. And of course, security is top of mind because you're deploying something like, you know, you're, you, you want to make sure that that's secure, right? So those are some of the challenges that a DevSecOps or a DevOps persona is going to kind of think about or have to or has to think about and uh, deal with when they're trying to deploy a Kubernetes or containerized application. Now, somebody who is actually maintaining and managing the entire platform, right? they need access to the cloud infrastructure they need tooling to kind of build that cluster they need you know they need to figure out you know based on given the kubernetes ecosystem and tools that they have and the cloud provider or the infrastructure they are going to support how do i build that stack is the stack integrated enough will the kubernetes api work end to end because kubernetes is really like the only way Kubernetes does a lot of these things is just because it has all these plugins and all these different drivers for a lot of different infrastructures, right? So if you're the person who is maintaining that stack of Kubernetes platform, if they do not maintain that stack, if they don't have the certain codes or plugins needed for the Kubernetes API to operate, that stack is not going to work as needed. They of course have to think about security. You know, is this a secure stack? What are the you know the stack has so many abstractions that they don't have. To, they have to think at each layer of that abstraction stack, right? Right from the virtual machines to the container runtime to the container images that are deployed within them to the microservices that get deployed on top of them. Are the communications safe at each and every layer? How can I monitor what's going on in each and every layer, etc. Right, so. <clears throat> There's a lot going on. They need to bring in, you know, auth and uh, identity at that layer because anybody who has access to that platform kind of can do a lot within that cloud or infrastructure layer. So they need to think a lot about who has access to what, how is the stack secure, is it integrated, do, how do I apply patches to it, etc. right? So these are some of the challenges that, you know, at every layer of the Kubernetes containerized workload management stages. And these are also the opportunities where we feel if we optimize, we are going to reduce that toil time, right? And that is what we are doing with Tanzu. Within Tanzu, our goal is really to help, you know, develop solutions that reduce toil across these three different segments from application deployment, development to deployment to platform operations, right? And that's what we are doing. Now within Tanzu, we have two particular set of you know, solutions that we are bringing out uh, that help with uh, you know these three different stages. One is called the Tanzu application platform. 
and Thumbs application platform is really going to help the first two stages and then we have tons of kubernetes operations that is really you know centered around platform operations right uh, and we'll take a you know like deep dive look into each of these um, going on if there are any questions please post them in the question uh, q a box and we'll help answer them as we yeah, go towards the end of the presentation now <clears throat> from a application development perspective you know for tons we have tons for application platform and, and what it does is it really gives at that stage it gives the app dev team access to quick starts to dev tools it gives um, you know development teams access to self service um, you know development clusters so you have a portal where you log in where you know already the clusters that you are given access to they already you know you can see them you can access them etc and then it also provides you with automated container image creation etc right so as a developer you don't really have to think through okay what is my docker file do what do i need to do none of that right we have automated a lot of those steps you have self-service access to the cluster environment all you have to do is really define what you're doing in terms of the business logic code that thing and then give it to tons of application platform and app tons of application platform will take care of that we'll get into the details how it does but this is at a at a high level what tab does in that stage now when it comes to devops really what we are doing is again we do have the person who is operating the stack who is going to take that git you know that source code from the git repo and then it's going to deploy that secure that uh, and push that into a production cluster right first of all they'll need access to a production cluster the api in a secure with identity and authorization so that is where tons of for application platform we're going to provide you with that self-service access to that production cluster you have an automated again container create uh, you know container image creation process but at the same time we also have automated the you know depending upon what the application requires we are automating the yaml creation the kubernetes object creation all of that will be handled automatically by tons of for application platform at the same time it has central monitoring tools and vulnerability scanning for security purposes so if somebody who is completely new to kubernetes um, and they don't really you know f understand what are the different objects what do i need to do in order for this application to deploy on this platform we are really dumbing it down for them like you don't have you don't necessarily have to know that you just define your workload what it needs and we then convert those requirements into corresponding kubernetes requirements so all of that is automated using tons of application platform and so that's where we are solving a lot of the major challenges that come into that stage of you know deployment deploying workloads to production now when it comes to maintaining that production stack itself right now that is where we have tons of kubernetes operations tons of kubernetes operations you know it lets you deploy build manage kubernetes clusters in a given stack whether it's on vsphere whether it's on a given cloud provider um, <clears throat> We have a central portal where you can bring in multiple Kubernetes clusters together, whether these are managed clusters coming in from like GKE, EKS, AKS, or deployed by Tanzu. You can define automated, um, you know, um, fleet-wide policy management to secure those clusters, to define certain kind of baseline policies. Um, you can bring in your authentication or your identity source, whether it's LDAP, Active Directory, etc., and you can, you know, really uh, uh, use tons of Kubernetes operations to kind of um, uh, authenticate access to that Kubernetes API. We have a you know unified monitoring, logging um, dashboards that you can build. At the same time, you can even do tracing. And of course, everything that you deploy in terms of services, all the application microservices that are deployed. You know, even across clusters, like from vSphere cluster to a GKE cluster, for example, all of that is all you know, self-encrypted, automated, automatically encrypted using TLS and all of that, right? So, we we provide um, out of the box encryption services to kind of encrypt a lot of that traffic. So that is what tons of Kubernetes Ops does at that stage, kind of you know, resolving some of the challenges that ops team face while maintaining that Kubernetes stack.
So this is what overall of Tanzu does from a dev uh, experience to dev, DevOps to, you know, Kubernetes platform, taking, you know, or, you know, it, along the way, we are reducing toil by solving or automating challenges that the teams face during that phase of, or that life cycle of your containerized workload creation and deployment. Now, <clears throat> I just want to quickly, like, we talked a lot about what Tanzu application platform and TKO does or tons of Kubernetes operations does. Let's take a like second level, you know, look into what tons of Kubernetes operations does. We're going to follow this way through a demo as well. So if you can just bear with us, we'll quickly go through this and get into demo. So this is, um, you know, your typical uh, deployment workload, right? You have a dev team that is going to talk to a Kubernetes cluster that may be sitting on top of <coughs> excuse me, a cloud provider, vSphere, Azure, etc. <coughs> excuse me. I'm sorry, I'm recovering from COVID, so you, my voice is a bit scratchy and not working fine. <coughs> right. You know, so if you think about the person who is maintaining and managing that particular stack you know as containerized workloads and applications get deployed they will require some storage some networking some services which are nothing but like in load balancing services etc you know on day zero somebody has to you know build that stack given the ecosystem that kubernetes has you know it means you know for a given cluster what is my node size uh, what operating system do I need? What particular, you know, software packages do I need to bundle in that operating system for that container runtime to work properly? A lot of those things that, you know, decisions that have to go through <coughs> is something that, you know, you have to think about in day zero. Now, as you deploy these clusters and, you know, manage that particular platform for Kubernetes, um, you know, development teams are going to start having to access that API, that Kubernetes API. And that API is pretty powerful. So if somebody who has access to that API, they can really do whatever they want to do within that infrastructure, right? So you need to have authenticated access to that API, right? And at the right level. So Kubernetes has its own RBAC definitions for what people can do with that Kubernetes API but then it doesn't have any inbuilt access and identity management. So you need to bring that in. And then as uh, development teams start deploying workloads or containers at the, as those DevOps teams are starting to deploy, as an operations teams, you really don't know what's going on because they have access to the Kubernetes API and they're starting to deploy something. But uh, you may want to deploy some guardrails around what are the possibilities, right? Okay. I know that any container image, for example, with a vulnerability, vulnerability level of critical, you don't want them to be deployed. Or you know that as a policy, your organization does not allow anybody to deploy any container image from Docker Hub, for example. So you need certain, you need ways to establish certain ground policies or ground rules for what that API and DevOps teams can do. Um, Similarly, you know, the services that are being encrypted, well, um, you know, that are being deployed, whether they're encrypted, secure, etc. And then, of course, full stack monitoring, backup, restore, upgrade, scale, all of those capabilities that are required or necessary from a platform to manage, right? And that is what tons of Kubernetes does, is it gives you the capability on day zero to deploy that secure Kubernetes cluster on a given infrastructure all automatically. It provides you a central way of bringing in identity that you can port into multiple clusters, whether they are on vSphere, whether they are on AWS, doesn't really matter. It gives you a fleet-wide policy management to kind of create policies that are your organizational or you know company-wide policies that can be applied to any Kubernetes cluster that is there or that gets created again all of this is automated it's fleet wide you can just define it once 
and it can apply to every cluster that's managed by Tanzu. We have cross cloud service mesh that has mutual TLS enabled by default. So all the microservices that get created, you can create a global ingress gateway, you can define uh, encryption policies and make sure that all the communication is encrypted. And of course, you have full stack monitoring, traceability, logging, and backup, restore, scaling, etc. So that is what tons of Kubernetes does, uh, operations does for you. This is a quick, like a architecture diagram. You'll have like, you know, there are multiple components that are part of tons of Kubernetes uh, operations. Um, at the beginning, you have Tanzu Mission Control, which kind of has that identity management, the policy management, backup and restore, <clears throat> an application catalog, and provisioning capabilities. <coughs> at the same time, you can deploy Tan you know, Tanzu Kubernetes Grid, which is part of TKO, onto individual uh, infrastructures. <coughs> Excuse me. And TKG brings in everything that is needed, all the different CNI, CSI is needed to operate that stack optimally on that particular given infrastructure is given by TKG, which is part of Tansu Kubernetes operations. <coughs> As these Kubernetes clusters start building microservices, you have Tansu service mesh that is going to secure all the communication traffic and then you have tons of observability that can monitor log metrics traceability across a lot of the entire stack. So this is in nutshell what TKO is. We'll get into the demo of this, but before that, let's take a look at the application platform and think, Ryan, if you can help me out here, like I need a break from my coughing, sorry. Yeah, sure. No problem, Bosky. Thanks. Um, I'll just have you kind of go through the next slide. So <clears throat> as Bosky spent a lot of time talking about, the whole purpose of the Tanzu application platform is to really abstract the the developers and operators away from the complexity of Kubernetes from a from a um, application standpoint. So when we think about what it takes for a developer to get an application deployed in a typical Kubernetes environment. There's a whole bunch of steps, right? And some of the ones that you kind of see here is they build their application, they create a Docker file. They've got to then prep that or use that Docker file to build an image and push it up into a container registry. And we're not done there, right? So we've got our application containerized, but now we also have to define the spec in order for Kubernetes to run that. So we have to tell Kubernetes how to actually run that application. So we've got to build that that YAML, um, which includes best practices. How are you going to access it via you know services and ingress? And then you have to apply it to the Kubernetes cluster, and that's that can end up being a lot of lines of code, right? You can get a Hello World app running in you know I don't know 30, 40 lines of code, but when you start adding in those best practices and making sure that it's secure and accessible, you can quickly have an application go from you know, 50 lines of code up to thousands of lines of code. So there's a lot of complexity and a lot of toil that we see our developers um, working on. And, and while they're doing that, you know, they're they're focusing on how to run their application in Kubernetes and not on the application itself, right? So that's just deriving them away from contributing to the value of their organization by creating awesome applications and, and you know, introducing new features. So do you want to go to the next slide, Bosky? Cool, thanks. So, yeah, so when we really talk about this, we break it up into two sections. And I talked about, you know, the developer and the DevSecOps, and I'll go through this here in a demo and kind of show how we break this up from an inner loop and an outer loop perspective. But but your developer and, and DevSecOps definitely have different roles. Um, but this is this is kind of how we break it up. So from a, from a um, sorry, go back one slide. Or actually, you know what, here, I'll just take control and I'll, I'll do my slides here. And I've got a, a different view of that. All right, was my screen visible there? I'm not seeing it. Bosky or Ann, if you can. Let me know if you can see my screen. Hey, Ryan, it's um still black. OK, sounds good. Let's just give it one second here. I know when we were practicing, it took a second to uh, to populate. Let me 
stop it and start it again here. There we go. Cool. Yep, looks good. All right, perfect. All right, so let me hop into to kind of the, the the deep dive in the demo decks on um, tons of application platforms. We already covered this. Let's let's hit here, and let's let's hop into our demo. Before we get into that, let me let me kind of set the stage for what we're going to do. So as um, as I walk through developer, I'm going to go through a couple slides here to kind of show exactly what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about that inner loop and that outer loop that that uh, Bosky had on on the slide right before um, we we switch over to my slide. So. What we're going to do um, is we're going to build and deploy a Spring Sensors application. And I'm going to approach this from two different perspectives. The first thing I'm going to do is uh, be a, act as a developer. So I'm going to put my developer hat on, and I'm going to walk through what we call the inner loop. And that's where our developers really spend all of their time with the Tanzu application platform. On the outer loop, <clears throat> we're going to we're going to spend some time looking at how we are going to take the application the developer has just developed, and we're going to go ahead and um, push it out to production. So developer has finished their application, pushed it up to GitHub, and then we're going to take it from an operator perspective and allow it to run through the supply chain. So this is what it looks like from a graphical reference representation. Um, if you've if you've seen any of the Tanzu application platform demos or slides before, this slide is going to look very familiar. It's it's one of the ones that we use to love uh, to really represent how this works. So let's focus on it from an inner loop perspective. So. Let me talk about my life as a developer when I'm using a Tanzu application platform and how we get started. So inside of the inner loop, we really want developer to focus on, you know, accelerating their um, development process, right? So they're not spending as much time toil on Kubernetes and, and trying to run the application. So we do that in a couple of ways. The first thing that we do is we provide API portals and application accelerators. And you'll see that here in a second. But the one I really like to focus on initially is the application accelerator. The Applications Accelerator, think of that as like a scaffold for a developer to get started with new applications so they're not starting from scratch. So it's a boilerplate template that allows them to get started with all of their organization's best practices, security configurations, those type of things. Once they've selected an accelerator, they're able to pull down that accelerator and iterate and debug on it to start producing their application. And I'll show how that works here in just a second. But basically think of it as pulling down the accelerator and then using their IDE in order to start building the application and get it deployed out to a live Kubernetes cluster so that they can test and develop their application in a production or in a cluster, the personal development cluster that will closely mimic what it's going to look like in production. So let's go ahead and take a look at what that is going to, uh, what that looks like. Okay, so let me pop into my um, into my IDE. And so, oops, sorry, let me hop back out here. And what we're going to do is we're going to go into our, um, our our tap GUI. And this is really the, the development interface, or sorry, the interface into the Tanzu application platform. And as I mentioned, we're going to get started with an application accelerator. So as a developer, I have a, a, a request to build a new application. And as I mentioned, we're going to build a Spring Sensors app. So you can see, as I go into the application accelerators, I have a whole list of applications. And these are ones that we just provide out of the box. But again, think of these as scaffolding or starter starter boilerplates to get started with an application so you're not starting from scratch. Like I said, these are ones that we provide out of box, but they're not intended to be you know, the ones that organizations are using. We absolutely make these customizable. And these are just really examples so you can get started. A lot of times we see um, roles such as software architects and uh, and in other um, other roles such as software architects and developers and DevOps teams or security teams contributing to these uh, accelerators in order to really adopt the end or the organization's best practices and give developers a starting point. So let's go ahead and choose our Spring Sensors accelerator. And let's go ahead and get started. So we can see here that we have a bunch of different options. And again, these are all customizable. So as a, you know, as a software architect or somebody who wants to provide an a accelerator for the organization to use and all of our developers use, we can go in and customize these. And they're really just a YAML configuration file. But we can provide all these options. And with this, I'm just going to provide the default. So let's go ahead and say Next. And what I can do now is I can generate the accelerator. So what's happening in the background is it's actually taking the configuration and it's populating all of those variables into it. 
So let's go ahead and explore the zip file here. And you can see that this is the accelerator that I'm gonna download as a developer, right? So these are all my all my uh, starter source code. So I have all the source code for my application here. But there's a couple things that I like to point out here. So one is this workload.yaml. And this workload.yaml is the heart and soul of the Tanzu application platform and how we're really focusing on, on driving and uh, removing developer from the complexity of Kubernetes. So we're trying to abstract them away from it. So, as, as Bosky mentioned earlier, you know, to get an application running on Kubernetes takes a lot of work, a lot of configuration. And I showed it in, in um, you know, one of my slides is that it can be, you know, 50 to, to thousands of lines of code in order to get this done. But what I like to point out here is we have 19 lines of code, right? So basically what's going to happen is we're going to supply this workload.yaml to the application platform. And it's going to consume our source code. And it's going to do a, a process that we like to identify as application aware. So it's going to actually inspect our source code, figure out what the application is, and then build the container image, as well as generate all of the Kubernetes source code for you automatically. The other thing that I like to point out in this accelerator is not necessarily the presence of a file, but more so the lack of a file. So as, as we talked about, in order to containerize and run your application in Kubernetes, you have to build a Docker file, right? Which those can have varying complexity. You can have a, a, you know, a Hello World Docker file that has you know, 10 lines of code in it. But when you start to think about things like um, you know, making sure that all the vulnerabilities are resolved, making sure that your application is running in best practices, that's where you really start to get complexity into Docker files. And you're starting to see your developers and your operators spending a lot of time building and maintaining those configuration files rather than, you know, writing good source code and, and developing new applications and providing new features to the application. So that's where we like to focus in on it. And I'll show this as part of the demo and show how it actually goes through and, and builds the application. So we've walked to that accelerator. So let's go ahead and hop out to our IDE. And let's go ahead, and I've already done this in the background just for time's sake, but let's go ahead and say, so this is the repository that I just pulled down, right? So this is the accelerator that I just, that I just downloaded. So it's my application. But let's say as a developer, I want to go ahead and start iterating on my application. Let's do a Tanzu live update start. And what we're going to see is it's going to actually build this application and push it out to a live Kubernetes uh, cluster in the background. Now, again, I've done this before just to save some time. But if I hadn't done that before, what you'd see is it's actually going to build a container image and it's going to generate the Kubernetes configuration to push it out to a, a live Kubernetes cluster. So we can see that my application is actually up and running. So let's hop over to my browser. Sorry for the back and forth here. Um, but let's do a localhost 8080. And we're going to see that my application is up and running, right? And this is unique because this is not running locally on my laptop. This is actually in my Tanzu application platform. Uh, cluster, which is running on top of Kubernetes, right? So the nice thing here, and the thing I always like to point out, is that it's not just running locally on my laptop. It's not using Docker Compose or something like that that's going to give you a completely different development environment than what you're going to be running in production. So let's hop over now that we've done that. So now let's say we're a developer, and we want to do just a little bit of iteration. And, and what I like to do here is just a simple modification. So let's just change the weather or the title of the application from Tanzu Sensors Database to Weather Sensors Database. And I'll save that. And as soon as I save it, what you start to see here is that we have identified that the same changes happen. And we're rebuilding that application to, to, um, for that change. And we're going to inject those modified files up into our running pod that's running in our Kubernetes cluster. So by the time I hop back over to my browser, I'm going to see that that modification has already happened, right? So very rapid, very quick iteration that we're giving to a developer to allow them to build and deploy and, and, uh, and iterate on their application in a live Kubernetes cluster, which is going to closely mimic what the application is going to run in production, right? So the, the good thing about that from, a, from a, both a developer and from a DevOps you know, persona perspective is that with those similarities environments, you remove a lot of those environmental variables that are typically plague you know, the path to production. Okay, so let's hop over now. So we've kind of walked through the developer experience. We've talked about what that looks like. Let's look at it from a operator experience. So we typically draw the line of demarcation here between the developer and the operator as the check-in or the merge uh, point. So whenever the developer has finished building their code, they've either checked it in or they've opened a pull request and they've merged that code in. And that's really where the outer loop takes over and where your, your uh, security and operations teams are involved. So there's a lot of steps that typically occur in an outer loop. And a lot of organizations have their own what we call paths to production, right? So take the source code. How do I get that source code to a running application in a production environment? 
And a lot of organizations have really good processes and some of them have, um, you know, not so good processes. But the point is, is everybody has a process and steps that they have to check off in the in the process. So how we do this is we we provide supply chains that allow organizations to identify what their process is and produce uh, steps in that supply chain. So let's take a look at the example of one that we're going to do today. So in this example one, we have three, but this is the most complex one. And it's the one that we see most organizations adopting and, and using. So essentially what we do is we are going to pull our source code down and we're going to test that source code using Tekton um, continuous integration testing tools. Once we completed those tests and everything is passed, we're going to do a source code scan on it. So again, we're introducing security here in the supply chain. We're shifting it as far left as we possibly can in order to get, um, you know, to prevent applications with vulnerabilities from reaching production before they even get there. The next step we're gonna do is we're gonna build it. So we use something called build packs, cloud native build packs, which are gonna analyze the source code. And I talked earlier about the Docker files and the need for to, to not have one, but the Docker file, or the, sorry, the, the cloud native build packs essentially analyze the source code. And then they build a container image based off of the contents of those of those build packs. And these are these build packs are used in a lot of different tools. They're supported by the community. So um, things like Cloud Foundry and Heroku all use these build packs. So it's they're widely adopted by the community. And the really nice thing that I always like to talk about here is that you're relying on the open source community to tell you and to build your container images for you. So it's no longer your operations and your developers that are having to spend cycles doing that. You're leveraging the community to, in order to do that. So once that image has been built and pushed and, and optionally signed, if you want to sign the container image, we then pull that image uh, process, or we then pull that image down and we scan it with our gripe image scanner. And this gripe image scanner is going to take a look at all the vulnerabilities that are in it. It's going to compare it against our scan policy. So if it has any vulnerabilities that exceed our scan policy, so let's say we don't allow any critical vulnerabilities to be published into production, then it's going to stop our supply chain right there. Assuming that we pass the image scan, the final step is going to be to run, run Kubernetes. And this is really kind of a, you know, a, a very simplified box for what's going on. But what I like to point out is that during that build process of that container image, we're, we're creating a SBOM. Um, uh, so it's a bill of materials that then is a, then able to be used in our supply chain in order to identify the type of application it is so that we can configure all the Kubernetes runtime configuration for it. So here, we're not requiring our developer or our operator in order to, uh, to, to build that Kubernetes configuration, again, allowing them to focus on the application itself and driving value to the organization. So one of the things I like to point out too is, is and the thing that I get asked is, What's the difference here between, you know, a supply chain that we're talking about and just a continuous deployment task? <clears throat> so going back to the build phase, so if I cycle back here, um, one of the things that, that is really nice about a supply chain is it's monitoring every step in the process. So the Tanzu build service, which we're leveraging to build images in the background, is actually watching and maintaining the, the cloud native build packs as well as the base operating system images. So let's say a new base operating system image gets published that resolves a vulnerability. The supply chain is going to detect that and it's going to automatically kick off our build right here at the build phase and continue forward into image scan and run. So it's constantly monitoring, constantly reconciling to ensure that you have all of the latest, greatest, not just code, but also you know images and scan policies and um, you know scan libraries and those types of things. So we've talked about that. One of the things that is really important and critical to understand here is I've talked about a lot of different tools, right? I talked about Tekton, I talked about Gripe, I talked about the Tanzu Build Service, but we want to make sure that we have flexibility in those tools. So, you know, a lot of organizations have existing processes in place and their existing investments into tools such as Jenkins or Sneak. So we want to make sure in supply chains that these are adaptable, that they have the ability to swap out uh, Tekton for Jenkins if they have a significant investment in Tekton. So we're certainly working, or sorry, a significant investment in Jenkins. So we're certainly working towards that, but it's always important to point that out because it's a question that we get fairly often is, you know, I have a ton of uh, Jenkins supply or um, uh, continuous integration tests. Can I leverage those? And the answer is absolutely yes. Okay. So I just kind of talked about what that supply chain looks like. Let's go ahead and hop out. And I want to show one that I had previously run. So, um, to, to save a little bit of time here, let's hop out here. And hey Ryan, just a quick call out. Like we only have five minutes left, and think we also need to go to one more demo. So, oh, sure. sorry, sorry, I thought I thought you were done. Done. Okay. Um, let me give me one second here, and I'll just finish this up. 
So we can see we have our um, spring sensor supply chain. It's completely stepped all the way through here. Um, and so it's, it's deployed uh, the application out. And if we hop out here and we go to spring sensors and our runtime resources, and we can actually click the URL and we can see that the application that our developer just developed is going to be out here and deployed. And it's going to take one second to load. And unfortunately, I'm not going to get into why that is, but it's basically scaled it down to zero in the background because there had been no request. So you can see our application is deployed. Okay. Sorry, Boski. I'll hand it back to you now. No worries. Thank you so much. So I'm, I'm going to just share my screen so I can um, talk a little bit about um, I think what Ryan showed was really, you know, what is, um, you know, what is um, uh, tons of our application platform. And now what we're going to do is really take a little bit deeper look at what is tons of Kubernetes operations. I know we really short at times. So if you have questions, please start uh, putting them in the chat box. Can you, sh can you all see my screen? Um, it's still black, so why don't you try to start I, sharing one more time? Yeah, I had to stop sharing and then share it again, Bosky. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. There we go. So, for somebody who is actually maintaining that stack in tons of Kubernetes operations, this is what it looks like, really. Tons of machine control is kind of the default, you know, portal where you would log in. You can see, of you know, a lot of your clusters here, um, not just from vSphere, but of course, if you have any that were deployed in AWS, Google Cloud, Azure, all of that you can see over here. You can even, you know, once you have a TKG run demo in a given environment, let's say you have vSphere and AWS and you deploy TKG in both areas, like, you know, you're seeing it right now, I can actually select one and start creating a new cluster, give it all the details, like, okay, which AWS account do you want to run this into? What are my credentials, etc. Give it a cluster name, give some basic configuration items and hit cluster create. This will start remotely creating that Kubernetes cluster in AWS, in your given infrastructure, or in vSphere, wherever you have selected that cluster to create. And within like five to 10 minutes, you have a completely integrated stack with Kubernetes created on top of that. And once you have the cluster created, you can actually define, you know, access to that particular cluster through groups of clusters or through individual cluster, however you want it to be. So for example, these are all the different cluster groups that we have over here. And if you get into any one of them, you know, I can, define a specific access policy for that cluster as an admin like okay which user has access to kind of what kind of role and you know which identity uh, source so if you're bringing in LDAP you know any of that identity service providers you can actually map that to a particular role within Kubernetes and create that role binding for your user so um, you know this is how when like somebody who is who has access to TAP, you can even create TAP ca as a catalog and start deploying that on top of that cluster. So when the developer, you know, that Ryan was talking about, comes in and logs into this portal, they, they will only see access to the cluster that they have access to. They can get in, click on actions and access this cluster and download the kube config file for their local development process, right? So this is how you know you are binding tons of application catalog to tons of Kubernetes, um, tons of Kubernetes operations. Now this was just the cluster, and you know once a new upgrade is available, you can even update clusters remotely through the central portal. You can also define all kinds of policies, right? All the way from not just the access policies, but you know all the different security, image registry, scanning, code policies from the central repository, you can define it at the root level so that it trickles down to any cluster that is being managed by tons of machine control. Or you can define it, you know, different policies at different, you know, cl cluster groups, however you like it. And you can actually get into a cluster, let's say, uh, <clears throat> for example, I have a GKE TSM cluster. You can actually, you know, quickly go to actions and integrate it for observability and service mesh. What this is going to do is as you click on these services, you will see all the, you know, different microservices that were part of 
that particular cluster. Uh, you can see that mutual TLS was you know created by default. You can create global load balancing services, you know policies, all of that, right? So sorry, I think I need to log back in over here. You can also use Tansu observability to kind of monitor all the clusters either together or, you know, it gives you a summary of what's going on within that stack. You can, you know, look at logs, you can do traceability, you know, application level metrics, all of that in a single place through Tanzu observability. And all of this is part of Tanzu for Kubernetes operations, right? So if I go back to my Tanzu service mesh, let me just get into the right organization. So this is what you're seeing right now. This Acme Fitness is really a logical construct of all the microservices that are part of an application that is actually running between two Kubernetes clusters. One is on vSphere and one is in GKE. But uh, using Tanzu Service Mesh, I'm able to create mutual TLS between the services that are running across. I can define workload-based policies for service-to-service -service encryption, for scaling, all kinds of beautiful stuff that you can do at the service level through Tanzu Service Mesh, right? So in all, that is, I think we're over time now, but in, in all, I think that is that is the capabilities that we are, or the entire portfolio of solutions that we are bringing via Tanzu to kind of help solve a lot of these toil or a lot of the challenges that teams still face, managing, operating, deploying applications on around Kubernetes. Back to you, Ann. All right, thank you both for taking the time to speak with us today. As a reminder to our audience, you'll receive a follow-up email with the on-demand link from today's webcast. To find out more about the VMUG webcast program, visit vmug.com and check out the webcast page. Please make sure to complete the short online evaluation that will pop up as you exit the webcast and let us know how today's session went. And from all of us here at VMUG, thanks and have a great rest of your day.